Hello, I'm your host Jim McLean. Thanks for tuning in once again to our movie review show here on NVTV. Let's see what movies from the big and small screen we'll be looking at tonight. We'll be reviewing Robert Eggers' latest film, The Northman, and John Madden's Operation Mincemeat, both of which are out in cinemas now. Our pick of the streams is the Netflix comedy The Bubble, directed by Judd Apatow. And I'll be interviewing filmmakers Chris Lofine and Travis Clough about their latest film, Held, ahead of its release on DVD this week. So that's what we've lined up for you in this week's show. And joining me here in the NVTV studio is one quarter of The Sixth Sense. But here at NVTV, we know him better as the Grumpy Gamer. It's local filmmaker Bill Taylor. How's it going, Jim? Bill, it's good to have you back. This is the first time this series we'll have you on. First time 2022. We've got three films we're going to be discussing. But as always, before we get into discussing those movies, let's talk a little bit of movie news. I know there's a lot of things I'm sure. I mentioned in Grumpy Gamer, you might be excited. There's a Street of Rage movie now apparently in development. We had a trailer for Thor Love and Thunder with uh, the latest instalment in the MCU, another Thor movie by Taika Waititi. That is a bit of a tongue twister to say, but are you excited, Bill? Are you still getting excited about the MCU stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed Thor Ragnarok, loved it, and Taika Waititi just took us on an amazing journey. Um, we're now in, what's this, this is phase four of Marvel. Yeah, I mean, the trailer only lasts about a minute, and then, it, you know, we get a wee bit of the Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine, and I don't know how much of an influence that's going to have on the story. Um, but it's it's yet another Thor film where he goes out to discover himself. I think that's every Thor film, and even a bit of Endgame as well, that he, he needs to go out and find himself. So it'll be interesting what they come up with. Well, look, Bill, we're men of a of a certain age, you know, we all know that it takes a little time to, to find yourself, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, it's definitely got my attention. I'm a huge fan of Taika Waititi. I like what he did with the Thor franchise. I think he has rejuvenated it uh, and brought new life into that franchise, that particular character in the MCU. So I look, I'm looking forward, I think it's July. It's out later this year, but we'll have to wait to review that film then. But for now, let's have a look at what's in cinemas now. to such a hellish place. To find what was stolen from me. And what is that? The kingdom. You must choose between kindness for your kin or hate for your enemies. Your strength breaks men's bones. Ah! I have the cunning to break their minds. Ah! And night by night, we will carry out my pledge of vengeance. I will avenge you, father. I will avenge you, father. I will save you, mother. I will save you, mother. I will kill you, father. So that's a look at the Northman. It's out in cinemas now, Bill. Robert Eggers has set out apparently to make the ultimate Viking movie on screen. And as we mentioned on last week's show, it just so happened to be primarily filmed here in Northern Ireland. So I guess a, there's a lot of local interest. I have my thoughts on the film, but as our reviewer this week, let's hear what you think. What did you make of The Northman? I absolutely hate it. Um, it's really boring. It's really drawn out. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Okay, <laughs> short and sharp, Bill. I I didn't know what to expect when when we, we thought of asking you to review the Northman for us. I will admit I'm a little bit disappointed by it because we're going to be talking about two films this week on the big screen, and one I went in with not with no expectations at all. Another I went in with very high expectations. I am a fan of Robert Eggers as a filmmaker. I love The Witch, I love The Lighthouse. And those are two great horror films that primarily deal with isolation and the effect of isolation. 
This is Robert Eggers moving into more mainstream filmmaking. He's working with a bigger budget. And I, I think something has been lost in that, in that transition. I think uh, there's, there's parts that I think are stunning. They're visceral. Some of the cinematography is absolutely fantastic. But a bit like you, I find myself, and I, I've used this, this phrase quite a lot this series, so maybe it must be my go-to for 2022. I find myself with very little emotional engagement with what was happening on screen. Now, clearly, I didn't have as negative as effect as you. I sat there in my seat willing myself to think, I, I want to like this more. There's a lot of things I can respect about it, and I'm very, very proud that it's been primarily filmed here, and I think it's a great showcase of the talent, not in front of the camera, but behind the scenes that we have now here in, in the local scene within the industry. We look at kind of what a legacy something like Game of Thrones has had. You can see that has clearly had an influence, but still with all that, you had a very negative experience. Don't get me wrong, Jim. It looks beautiful. I mean, you could literally pause that film anywhere and it looks like a masterpiece. It looks like a painting. You know, any, all the scenes, it's, it's beautifully shot. You see stunning landscapes. The costumes and, and, and everything like that are absolutely fantastic. The cast, yeah, they're great. You know, it's, you've got established people that know their craft and know what they're doing. I, I don't know what it is. Is it, is it the story? Is it, I don't know. But what it did find was, see all those long, those long shots. It's like, well, you get to the point, you know, come on. You could have easily shaved half an hour off that film. It goes on for, you know, there's long meandering shots. And there's parts of it as well that I kind of felt um, that I was watching a play because the characters are, you know, they're telling you how they're feeling. And, you know, it's... You know, a bit, of, a bit of research, you know, the main character is called Amleth. It's based on a, a Scandinavian story, which, you know, Hamlet is based off, loose, very, very loosely based off. So, you know, it's it kind of, you know, you can see where Shakespeare kind of got his inspirations from. Bjork turns up. I don't know. The, the, that's the thing. I think that's part of the story that really annoyed me. It's the wee fellow, essentially the wee fellow witnesses his father getting killed. Right, stay with me, folks. He witnesses his father getting killed, and he, he you know, he promises, you know, he's going to avenge, 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 and so he, he disappears and grows up and joins another tribe and becomes like a, a Viking berserker for another tribe, and it takes Bjork to come into the film to remind him that shouldn't you really be doing something else, and he's like. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to be avenging my da and saving my ma. I forgot all about that. And then off go, you know, off goes the journey. There's a couple of things that niggled with me. The accents are all over the place. They they really are. Um, but I I respect it. I don't love it. If that's the best way I can put it, it's the, probably the, as we're coming up to an election, a politician's answer. I respect it. I don't love it. And. Maybe I'm going into it with too high expectations because I've seen too many five-star reviews, too many friends and fellow critics that I respect greatly just saying that this is without doubt already as we're, we're only in April, as we're recording this now, it's going to be the film of the year. And I haven't watched it. I go, look, I, I, I enjoyed aspects of it. I think visually it's stunning. I'm immensely proud that The Northman was filmed here. I know I'm repeating myself, but... I just sat in my seat and wished I liked it more. Who is this film aimed at? Who's its, who's its, who's its audience? Because it's certainly not going to be for your average cinema goer. And it's, I don't know, I, I think local interest is probably what's going to pique the, the, you know, the, the Northern Irish cinema people, the cinephiles. I think that's what's... But yeah, your man Robert Eggers, the only film I've seen of his is uh, The Witch. And I loved it. Thought it was really good. Thought it was really creepy, you know. Um, but this, it's like, I don't know. Uh, there is definitely some disconnect with the, you, you know, the character, uh, the main character. You, there's, I don't know, there's not enough there. I, I don't know what it is. 
But I think it's possibly the filmmaking style is at fault there. I think it's playing too much on the artsy side rather than actually the story side. I think that's where it falls down. And I think if, if, if there wasn't as many of the sort of steady cam shots and all this fancy camera work and, you know, people talking down the camera, I think there was less of that. I think maybe you would have got there. I mean, for my Viking reference, I'm, you know, I watched The Last Kingdom on Netflix. It's fantastic. I mean, it's, you know, it's as good as, as anything else that's out there. I've yet to see Vikings, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just fell flat for me. Okay, well, look, a mixed bag here. As I say, you're clearly more negative than I. I'm, I'm sitting in my seat wishing I liked it more. The last thing I will say, as always, Anya Taylor-Joy is, is worth cinema ticket alone. She was great in The Witch. She's great in this. Yeah, uh, you know, we'll have to just move along. And uh, we're going to move from the big screen to the small screen because this week also sees the release of Held on DVD and VOD services. And I got a chance to speak with the two filmmakers behind the film, Chris Loafing and Travis Clough, to talk about it over Zoom. And here's that interview. What brings you out this way? Just a weekend trip. By yourself? My husband's coming tomorrow. This weekend's important to me. Me too. Henry, I wasn't wearing this when I went to bed. What's your phone? It was, it was here. I have to hold for now and always. Happy anniversary, Mr. and Mrs. Barry. You will not leave the house again. Mr. Barrett, Mrs. Barrett, you must obey. So that's a look at the trailer for Held, and I'm joined now by the film's directors, Chris Loafing and Travis Clough, all the way from California, the power of Zoom in this digital world. So do you want to tell our viewers and tell our listeners as much as you feel they need to know about Held and its marriage therapy of sorts, uh, a film about marriage therapy of sorts? I don't know how much you guys want to divulge to our viewers, but I will let you lead the way. Well, you can't, you can't divulge too much, you can't divulge too much. But yeah, it has been described to us uh, before as Jigsaw's marriage counseling. Uh, it was a good way to sum it up, and we, we uh, like that summation, <laughs> we agree. Um, but yeah, it's held as a, it's a taut thriller. Someone told us it's kind of Hitchcockian in a way, and uh, it's about this couple who are struggling with their marriage. They go away to this Airbnb to try to fix things up. And, uh, and repair some of the damage that's been done over the years and soon find themselves locked in and being controlled by this voice that's telling them what to do to repair their, their marriage and, uh, are, and are forced to do these scary, terrible things. How did you end up being involved in this project? I was outside of our house just uh, noticing uh, potentially a new neighbor walking her dog and I went to introduce myself to be nice and, and uh, turns out she was just someone visiting our neighbor uh, across the street, her, her, which was her sister. And I said, oh, well, what are you doing up here? She's visiting, but I'm an actress in LA. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I produce films. And it's kind of a rare thing to find here in Central California. But I said, well, I'd love to see what you've got and what you've done. And she sent us a short film she directed and wrote. And, and starred in. And starred in. And it was really great. She did a really good job. And we, from there, said well, what are you working on what's next yeah, yeah and she had she said she had an idea for a feature and she wanted to run it by us and so we saw the script um she had didn't even have it written when we first met and she wrote a script real fast and then we kind of just went through a process of about six to eight months just developing that to the point where we felt strongly that we could uh produce it and direct it yeah and the production was so you know kind of slim in the sense that it was you know in one location very tight 
that we were like, well, shoot, nothing's standing in our way to make this. There's no red tape. Let's find a house and make this movie. And so we did. And we filmed it in 2019, right? Yeah, summer, 2019. Summer of 2019. Right before the pandemic, which was great because we were able to just spend time during the pandemic editing, uh, editing and doing visual effects and things like that. I think we should add at this point that, as you guys have mentioned, that your screenwriter is Jill Aubrey, who stars in this. Mm -hmm. So I just want to kind of come come back and you've talked there about that process. But can I push you further? What was that relationship like throughout that shoot, throughout the pre-production, working with Jill? She's starring in this. And this is something, I suppose, that is her acorn of an idea. And then handing it over to yourselves to an extent and then seeing that brought to the big screen. So so how was that process throughout? The, the writing process, working with Jill, was very smooth because she worked very fast. Yeah, and um, she took our notes quickly. Yeah, turned and if, around things very quickly. If ever there was something that she got hung up on, we would kind of take a stab at a piece of it or a section of it and then say, what do you think about this? And she would say, oh, I like that. That's great. And then kind of make it her own and... Uh, uh, you know, for a few small bits, but the bulk of the story came together pretty quickly. And then our biggest kind of conversations, I think, took place around the ending, you know, the third act, what what some of these reveals would be and how the action would play out and making it as intense as, as possible. And she, I think she, you know, relied heavily upon us to help with, you know, kind of the scary aspects and the horror aspects, which was fun. But during during uh, filming, she really handed everything off to us and, yeah. and entrusted us to to, to just... focus on the acting side of it. Yeah. Did the pandemic in any way help you? You talked about there being able to get more time in post and with special effects. So so what was that process like of having filmed? I've spoke to a few filmmakers over the years or over the last couple of years who've who've been filming throughout COVID and I find that a kind of a, a hard and complicated mm -hmm. process at time. Yeah. But what's it like to have something in the bag? and then basically yeah. have to have that kind of process of going through post and then now where you are here in 2022 being able to get well the film's been out on the festival circuit but it's right. getting a, a dvd release here in the uk and, and at the end of april it felt very fortunate to have it filmed completely before covid hit because we we for us it was no change we were just in the cave editing doing all post stuff so pandemic or not that's where we were going to be for the next you know six months um, so we were like, oh, thank goodness, you know, if this had hit while we were filming, it would have been devastating. And it's like, it's a, sh it sucks for filmmakers out there who were, yeah. in, you know, in production and all these productions you hear about, oh my gosh. Yeah. It is a nightmare to try to film with that kind of stuff. Um, that said though, I mean, when the movie was complete, there was a definite need for content, which was, which was nice there. We have seen some delays, especially in foreign territories. Uh, of movies getting released finally. And of course, theaters still kind of opening up in certain territories. So there's still there's still question marks in the air all over the world as to where some of these movies will go or how they're gonna come out. So I think with that process, the, the release process, it's been a little sluggish still. Um, and we're still seeing things kind of unfold. But, um, but, but all we, in all, we, we were very, very fortunate. fortunate. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess my last question is maybe you're not in a position to, but can you divulge what you'll be working on next? A little bit, yeah. We, we have a slate of films that we've been working towards getting a, a fund together. But we've also been working on a couple projects in the TV side. We shot a, a pilot for an action comedy that turned out really great and we're excited about it. We're starting to pitch it now um, to different streamers and, and uh, partners there. So a lot of different things. We're fans of all kinds of movies, not just horror, but horror is definitely fun as well. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we'll see. There's it's it's kind of a numbers game with anyone in the film industry. You got to have a lot of projects kind of at, at some stage. Yeah, percolating. And, and one of them's got to hit, you know, and that's with any studio, with anyone, really. OK, yeah. well, that's an optimistic note to end this interview. So, Travis, Chris, thank you very much. And and the film is out on the 25th of April here in the UK on DVD and VOD services. So check it out. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man. Make no mistake. Marriage is hard work. What if I told you there was a way? 
to get that spark back. There is a way. So that's my interview with Travis Clough and Chris Lofine. The film is out now on various VOD services. You also can get it on DVD and you can catch a longer version of the interview on our YouTube channel. But with that, we shall now move on to this week's Pick of the Streams. We're almost at the nest. like a baby crying for its mom. And cut. Now that was a great take. Welcome to the start of production of Cliff Beast 6. Thank you for joining us in our bubble. Please make sure you're wearing proper PPE. Physical touch is, of course, off the table. <laughs> so I would recommend making sweet eyes at each other. I'll show you what that looks like. <laughs> this is so exciting. It's like my movie posters have come to life. You will soon learn to hate these people. So that's a look at Judd Apatow's The Bubble. It's out on Netflix now, Bill. We didn't get off to the greatest of starts with The Northman. I had hoped you might have been a bit more positive, so you're part of a comedy group, you are a member of The Sixth Sense, as we said when we introduced in this week's show, so we thought we'd get a comedy for this week to try and, you know, an, a genre you know well. So what did you think of Judd Apatow's latest feature that just happens to be on Netflix? Awful. Um, I yeah, I had to be told it was a comedy because you'd be stretching to find any sort of jokes. Um, yeah, I, I was... I, it, it actually offended me after the first 10 minutes. I thought there were... It's a film supposedly set during the pandemic, during lockdown, and you're getting all these people together to make something in a bubble in quarantine and it just it really angered and offended me because I kind of felt that they were taking the mickey out of you know the the pandemic and it's like this isn't over yet why are we you know why are we making jokes about this there's still people in the hospitals there's still people dying what, what who, who greenlit this so if I I got over myself and I went right okay I'll give it a chance and I let it roll, and oh, I I don't know. This is dire. This is you've got an ensemble cast, and you know I, I will say shame on uh, Karen Gillan. You were in Doctor Who. You should know better. Um, um, and to be honest, we don't really get to know any of them. I kind of felt the film. The best way to describe the film, I think, is it's almost like a party of Tropic Thunder, and that it's a you know. These are guys, it's a, it's a film about a film in a film. You've got Pedro Pascal playing, a, I presume, a, a pseudo Johnny Depp kind of character. And it's, it just falls flat. And then you've got, you've got the rest of them, David Duchovny. I mean, whoo, your star has fallen, my friend. Um, no, I, I just, the whole thing annoyed me and it wasn't funny. There was a couple of, there was a couple of funny lines, but that's it. The rest of it is, it's, there's, I mean, there's not really much of a story either. I mean, there's no, you know, there's, there's very little resolution. There's, you know, it's, these people are trapped to make a film and it's, uh, uh, no, no. It, no, it, awful. It, it's good to, to see, Bill, that even in 2022, you're not afraid to sit in the fence. We, we definitely, <laughs> we don't get that issue. Look, I, I picked this. I am a fan of Judd Apatow. I have to admit that. I mean, at a so time, am I. At a time when so many friends I, I knew were going on about stuff like The Hangover and other films like that that I always find to be nasty for the sake of nasty, we had... Judd Apatow showing up with stuff like The 40-Year-Old Virgin, which I love. And even now, I will admit, looking at 
through now, there is a couple of issues when you look at it through under 2022's eyes and you look in the kind of post Me Too stuff. There's, there's issues about some aspects and some of those characters that are problematic, but I'm still a fan. But I'm struggling to, to really remember the last Judd Apatow comedy I loved. I mean, Trainwreck was, was okay. Since then, I, I know we had The King of Staten Island, which I thought was, was all right, but it does, and it's a problem, we seem to be talking week on week on this show. It, it's too long. I mean, I like my comedies to be about 90 minutes. This, this film, I know, sits well over two hours. Uh, it is a long two hours. You were talking about checking your watch during The Northman. I was checking my watch when I was watching this at home. And I could have very easily turned it off, like you, not out of any sense of that they were making light of the pandemic because I think what this is this is referencing kind of what was going on with the Jurassic World Dominion set where they were basically forced by the studio to sit in a hotel and bubble up and make the movie get it done and I think it's not funny enough is the central thing I would agree with you on but I also think it's probably a year and a half too late this to be on the money should have probably been out about January last year it's not me taking away from the fact that we're, we're still in a pandemic bill, but we're hopefully slowly moving further away from the days of lockdown and having to think about bubbles and things like that. I don't know. You're talking about The Northman. Don't know who it's for. I, I don't know who this film's for. It's making fun of the filmmaking process. And I'm sure there's probably filmmakers and producers watching that going, oh, that, that's, that's quite on the nose. That's quite funny. But I think as Joe Bloggs, on a Saturday night, he just wants to watch something to have a laugh. I, I was, I was genuinely, I was disappointed by what what we saw. But look, we usually at this point of the show wrap up to a DVD of the week. But because we had you on, because well, surprisingly, I was surprised you didn't like The Northman. Uh, I knew you were not a fan of the bubble from some messages you sent me through the week. I thought we'd try and finish on a positive note. And anyone who watches the show regularly will know the last time we had you on, we were talking about uh, World War I drama. We know you're a fan of those type of films. So I thought, it's in cinemas now. I thought we'd have a look at Operation Mincemeat. But before we hear your review, let's have a look at the trailer. In five weeks, 100,000 British forces will strike Sicily's southern shore. Unfortunately, the Nazis know of our intentions. So we're going to play a humiliating trick on Hitler. <laughs> we have to convince Germany that our target is Greece. The plan begins in Spain, where a corpse will wash up on shore bearing classified letters. A corpse carrying fake documents. <laughs> Given the fascist network there, we could quite literally float the documents right into enemy hands. Prime Minister, that's too big a risk. The fate of the world is at stake. The plan is highly implausible. So when can it be ready? So that's a look at Operation Mincemeat. Bill, you haven't had a good week, OK? Usually when we get you on the show, as we say, we know you don't sit in the fence. We know that. We know you don't sit in the fence with your reviews. You either like something or you don't. And I'm hoping that it's going to be third time lucky, that on the third film we're going to be reviewing this week with Operation Mincemeat, you'll be a fan. But do you want to very briefly for our viewers, do you want to give them a bit of setup? I know the trailer gives a bit of the setup for, but do you want to tell our viewers a little bit about what Operation Mincemeat's all about? Yeah, Operation Mincemeat was an operation for the British to fool the Nazis into thinking that their next strategic target was going to be Greece, when in fact it was Sicily, and the Nazis had quite a lot of soldiers on, on, this, on the island. The way that they do it is they essentially get a corpse and they have to have an identity and, and all that sort of stuff, uh, backstory and papers, and, and it's just, you know, they have to have the, the right people find the body at the right time and scan the papers, and they have to set a lot of balls in the, in the motion in order to fool German high command, so then they'll move their forces from Italy over to Greece, so then the evasion is successful. Okay, so then that brings me nicely. What do you think of the film? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I mean, the, the cast, it's got a hell of a cast. Uh, Colin Firth, Matthew McFadden, uh, Kelly MacDonald, uh, who doesn't love Kelly MacDonald? 
Uh, always remember, always been a big fan, remember her from Trainspotting. Uh, all those years ago. Yeah, it's a really, really good story, really good cast. Um, and, you know, it's, it's little films like that. that you know, I, I like things like that that sort of give me a little bit of a historic lesson because I'm kind of like, I, I like my, my World War Two and World War One stuff because, you know, I do a lot of the tabletop gaming and, and things like that. So it's good to get a bit of insight into these things. And, you know, history, if we don't, remember history, we'll not learn anything. Isn't that what the saying is? That is very true, Bill. Uh, for me, you know, I have to admit, I went in with very little expectations for this because I hadn't heard anything about the film. I had weirdly heard that there's a musical based, because it's based on a book and it was adapted into a musical that's been quite successful in the West End in London. I'm, I'm not tempted to go see that, but hey, stranger things have happened. I, I like this more than I expected. But then, as I've already mentioned, I went in with low expectations. There was issues for me. I think when the film is dealing with the actual operation itself and espionage and spy, there's a reference to the fact that Ian Fleming is there, that how much truth is there. I, I know there was truth in the fact that Ian Fleming was there, but how much he was involved with this actual operation, I don't know. When it, when it dealt with the operation and the logistics of it, I find it fascinating. I mean, you've got... Uh, as you mentioned, a great cast. You have Jason Isaacs. Hello to Jason Isaacs, by the way. But you have a great cast. And when the film is dealing with the operation, it's at its strongest. But then it throws in, it feels the need, because I guess it's trying to aim itself, and I hate the term, the grey pound. It throws in, there's a bit of romance in there. That didn't really work for me and I would like more focus just purely on the mission and if I'm really really honest the the man whose body who they use yes we get a little bit about him but I would like to learn more about about that man that said and I don't know if it was just me maybe you had the same response Bill but whether it was being emotionally manipulated I find myself getting quite emotional in there's there's closing credits and it deals with that legacy and the legacy of Operation Mince Meat. And I did find without going into spoilers, I did find myself getting a having having a little kind of, you know, teary eye. It must have been a very dusty cinema screen. So I enjoyed this more than I thought I would. And uh, it's gonna make the last question I'm gonna ask you this week. I, I guess I know where you're gonna go. I'm still undecided where I will go, but I think it's time that we asked that question. Bill, of the three films we've reviewed this week, what is your film of the week and why? Definitely Operation Men's Meat. Um, yeah, I think yeah, they could have maybe shaved maybe 15 minutes off it. Um, I understand why the love story was there, uh, kind of, you know, when they were doing their backstories and stuff, it was, I suppose, working close knit with people. It's hard to emotionally disentouch. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, the emotional payback you get from the end of that, not just, not just at that scene, but the scene before that, I think it was, you know, the, the outcome of the mission and stuff was, was a definite highlight for me. Um, and yeah, it's, that, that would be my recommendation. Go see that. Ignore the Northman. I'm tempted to give Operation Mince Meat my film of the week, but I think I have to just go for The Northman. And I know I was a kind of a lukewarm reception to it, but I think I genuinely went in with too high expectations. I still think The Northman is well worth a watch, as is Operation Mince Meat, but just for something that deserves to be seen on the biggest screen. Whether you like it or not, whether you end up feeling about the film the way Bill does, or maybe even feeling the way I feel about it, or maybe you come out thinking it's the film of the year, I think The Northman deserves to be seen on the big screen. So that's why that's my film of the week. But as I said, Operation Men's Meat is well worth a watch. But sadly, we're out of time this week, so all that's left for me to do now is thank my guests. So thank you very much, Bill Taylor. Thanks for having me. And thank you very much for watching at home. We'll be back next week with another episode. But for now, until then, goodbye. <laughs>